Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Casey and Greg are amazing researchers, and they dug into the uh, archaeological and historical records to find out more about the legend of the Mormon cave. So we're going to talk about the research they conducted and, and find out more about how they pinpointed where the cave actually was. So it's a fun conversation. You won't want to miss it. And also, I just want to mention, I know some of you listen on audio. You definitely want to check out the video on this one at youtube.com slash gospel tangents. Casey is an amazing video editor and added a lot of, uh, of clips of the cave and things like that to the video. So you won't want to miss it. So check out our conversation. And so through this research, we're starting to get a picture of like, what was this cave? Who, where did it come from? Who dug it? What was it used for? So I, I can give a, a little summary of, of just kind of the, the findings. And again, this is all coming from, from the historical record, which um, I, I would, just to clear the ground, Joseph Smith in anything that he ever left in terms of documentation never mentions the, the cave. Uh, no, and nobody in his family ever does as well. The, everything that we know about it comes from comes from second and, and third hand sources. So I think that at least needs to be acknowledged that that there there is a good reason to be reluctant about um, you know about how we process the, these sources. Um, however, there is a, a, a huge volume of sources about it. The, the volume of which uh, signifies that that there's probably that that this can't just be uh, ignored offhand. And um, even though the stories are not fully consistent, there's at least an, enough common threads that we can that we can uh, figure out what's going on. But the uh, so so the history of like how did this cave come to be? First, it's in Minor Hill that it's built into is is a uh, it's a drumlin, uh, which is created by you know glaciers during the ice age, uh, which means that there's no uh, it's just like packed scraped clay basically it's not limestone or anything where natural caves occur so um what that uh what that tells us is that you know this is this is fully art, an artificial cave this was dug by by human hands you would never expect to find a cave like this to occur uh, naturally so the the best source that we have about where this cave came from comes from a, 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 a interview by Lorenzo Saunders, who was a, a Palmyra resident. The, um, the interview is a little bit late. It's from the 1880s. Uh, I think it's, it was one of the RLDS apostles that interviewed him and just asked him about his early, early times for when he knew Joseph Smith. And he was, he was a couple years younger than Joseph Smith. So, uh, but, but he says that around 1822 or 1823, uh, he mentions um, that there was Kind of this this magician slash fortune teller slash necromancer conjurer character named Lumen Walters who kind of came to town and rounded up a lot of the uh, the or the excitement around the treasure digging and you know what's your fortune are you going to get some gold and, and things like that and would would kind of do these little um, magic tricks or these magic ceremony type things and be like, hey, your pot of gold is here and your pot of gold is there. And then and then kind of get get people to start digging. Um, and you know, some people were really into it. Some people just saw it as a complete fraud. Um, but it seems like as part of that, Lumen uh, he recruits um, uh, Joe Smith Sr, Alvin Smith, and Willard Chase. So Willard Chase was was uh, was a neighbor of the Smiths. lived in the, in the plot uh, or in the, the the land directly east of of the Smiths, and he was the same age as Alvin. Uh, and and they said, and you know, he charged him money and did this little thing. He was like, "Your gold is 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 right there." And so they started digging, and there's like, you know, he had some story about what what might be already in the hill. It was like it was almost like they were expecting there to be a pocket of something uh, in the hill, and they just had to tunnel in to to find it. So they they start digging and 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 Lorenzo Saunders he's um, in eighteen twenty two he's about eleven or twelve years old um, and he he says that he sees Joseph Smith Senior and uh, Alvin and then later Willard Chase is also mentioned as having started having started the dig um, and and the date we can date it because he says he mentions in, in the same uh, in this, almost in the same breath that this was the summer before Alvin died. Uh, and Alvin, Alvin died in 1823 in November. 
And so that summer kind of places uh, a time frame for, for where this dig would have started and, and who might have been involved. So do you think that, that Joseph, so Joseph Sr. and Alvin were, were digging this, were they looking for Spanish treasure or something like that? Or It, it seems rela- related to that. Uh, it's, it's unclear whether this was, um, whether, whether this was the, the Spanish buccaneers uh, treasure trove that they were looking for or whether it was, it was something else. But they seem to have been tipped off by, by Lumen. Um, and, uh, but you know, the, the sources, like even in the interviews, it's kind of all over the place. It's, it's really hard to, to get a straight answer, just like you know, why and where. And um, we can piece together some things, but it is, it is muddled. So it wasn't like a potato cellar or something like that to store. It, it may have become that. There is an indication that it was, it was turned into that. I mean, and, and it also could be, I mean, this source, Lorenzo Saunders, he was pretty young at the time, uh, you know, he was not, not even a, a teenager at this time. So it could be that his memory was off or that he got influenced by, by other stories later. Um, but th- there is one thing that he brings up that also helps us uh, time it, because he does say that they put a door, that they, they built this, they dug this tunnel, they, and they, they put a door on it, and, um, and that apparently was causing a nuisance of some sort. And his father, who was Enoch Saunders, uh, apparently ordered the cave to be locked up and shut down or the, the, the door to be boarded up or, or something like that. And, and Lorenzo says, I was one of those that came and, and boarded up that, uh, that door at the request of my father. And we know that, that Enoch Saunders, he's buried in the Palmyra Cemetery and the date on his tombstone is 1825. So that, that uh, that kind of puts that, it seems like the tunnel was started in maybe 22, 23, and it was at least at some level of completion uh, and usage by 1825, um, and then was boarded up. And that's kind of where, where the story ends as far as Lorenzo Saunders uh, is, is concerned. So it was a problem because of animals getting in there, or it was a safety concern, or you, you don't know? We, we don't know. Uh, I, I imagine... I imagine safety concern for kids. I imagine safety. I mean, the other strange thing is this was not the Smith's property, and the Saunders eventually acquire the, uh, the the property. But at that at that time, that during the um, so the the pedigree of the plot is it was the property of Abner Cole, who was uh, the editor of the Palmyra Reflector um, from uh, the early eighteen twenty to eighteen twenty two ish, and then he sold it to this guy named Benjamin Tabor who had it during that time during during the dig and then the saunders buy it uh and then later it, it gets sold to the minor family and that's why it's called minor minor hill oh m-i-n-e-r right yeah okay there's no actual mine there this is uh, not, not much to find in, in the clay okay so where do we go next so as far as like, what do we know about, about this cave? The, the sources of, from the people that were there earliest kind of bring us to, to 1825. And it involves Joe Smith Sr., Alvin. It says that Joe Smith was there. Maybe he was digging, maybe he wasn't. But uh, ultimately the cave becomes um, 40 feet deep. Wow, that's a really good size. Yeah. This was not a casual effort. A lot of people worked on this uh, for a lot of time. But we kind of have the date of at, at least around 25, it was shut down or kind of, you know, stopped being used uh, for some time. I mean, was, were there concerns about cave-ins? Because I would think they would build some trusses or something and some lumber in there to keep it from caving in. There was some indication of stuff around the outside, but that seemed to be more of a, of a um, entrance and, and a, you know, uh, not so much a structural thing. Hmm. But as you get into the later sources, it does talk, talk about how this 40 foot cave, little by little, the entrance kept on you know, eroding and, and mm-hmm. the tunnel itself started shrinking into the- Into the cave. Yeah, yeah in, into the hill. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that the hill entrance just kind of re- kept receding. So yeah, that's what we know about kind of the, the early period. The, then the question is, well, then what happens, what happens to the cave from, from that point on? And, and there the, there's kind of a gap in the, in the record um, that, that makes it hard to, to determine that. But there are some inferences uh, that, that can be made. So th- this actually kind of coincides with the visits of, of Moroni, because that, that summer um, that before Alvin died, 
Moroni comes that for that September, September 22nd, so in the fall, and then Alvin dies in, in November. And that's when the cave is is first uh, dug and and starts to exist. Eighteen twenty three, right? Eighteen twenty three, yeah. And then so four years later, is when the when the plates are, are obtained, there's never any indication that Joseph Smith tries to hide the the plates in the cave or or that the cave factors into into anything related to, to that uh, to that point. But for for all we can assume, it, it's still there. Uh, I mean, it's still there today. So of course, it was it was still there in, in those uh, during that time. You have Joseph moving to to Harmony to do the, uh, the the translation. He's staying there with with Emma. But then after the translation is done, um, he entrusts uh, Oliver Cowdery with the manuscript, and Oliver goes back to Palmyra, and that's when when they're engaging with the printer and, and working towards um, getting the printer's manuscript ready for for publication. And there are some very interesting statements from John Gilbert, who was the typesetter. He was just a few years older than Joseph Smith uh, at, at the time. Um, and, but he was, kind of, he was the, the guy in charge of doing the, the typesetting and, and of basically receiving the manuscript and then and putting it into type. And he talks about how Hiram, it was Hiram and, and Oliver that were uh, kind of the, the, the go-betweens between where they were preparing the manuscript and uh, and and taken to the print shop. Now during this time, Joseph Smith, he's in he's in Palmyra. I mean, he's in Harmony, Pennsylvania. So he's he's far away. And Gilbert says, you know, I didn't see jo Joseph Smith hardly at all, but I saw Hiram a lot. So it looks like Hiram and Oliver are are working are working on this. And Gilbert, he he has some sense of what's going on. He's like, this is translated. He says in in these later interviews, he's like, they translated the Book of Mormon in a cave. He's, he's clearly misinformed because at that point it was already translated. It was translated in Pennsylvania and, and parts of it in, in Fayette. But from his vantage point, he's just seeing them go back and forth from his office to what it, it seems to be uh, the cave. Because he, he keeps on mentioning this cave as that's where they're doing, you know, preparing the manuscript. He thinks it's translation. What I think is, is it could be the, the copying of the manuscript itself was happening uh, in the cave. So you think that Oliver and Hiram were copying the printer's manuscript in the cave? I, I think there's a, there's a possibility yes. for, for that. Yes. Wow. Here's why I think that, or, or why I'm open to that. Again, we don't know. We don't know. But, but, but yes, it's but I, I think this is a hypothesis that, that can withstand some level of, of scrutiny and uh, for the following reasons. One, Oliver, Oliver is charged with, with preparing the manuscript and giving it to the printer. And as far as, as we know, we, he is boarding with the Smiths. Now, I, I, I have to sort out some of the details of whether he's with uh, the Smith parents or, or, with, or whether he is staying with, with Hiram. Um, but he is corresponding with Joseph during this, this, this period. And in, so this is 1829. You know, most of the translation is happening that spring. And now, now it's getting ready for publication. This is in October and November. He is, he is copying the printed manuscript. And in November, he says that I am at the part where, uh, where Alma is talking to his sons. In a letter to Joseph Smith. In a letter to Joseph Smith. And, and, and so that gives us a date of like, what was he doing at what point where, and he's, um, and, and so he's not in harmony. He's, he's, there, he's there up in, up in Palmyra. Uh, and um, around this time, and, and this is, uh, I, was, I was trying to get confirmation on the state, the, uh, the Smith family had lost access to the frame home because uh, they, they couldn't make their payments and they all had to move back to the log cabin. Now, um, I, I still have to establish whether Oliver was staying there or whether he was in a, in a different place, but uh, it would have been very crowded. There are young kids and, and toddlers, Oliver's probably sleeping on the floor. Uh, if he has to do his, his office work, you know, his work from home copying, uh, if he's if he has to do that, you know, on the kitchen table with th that just doesn't seem I, I think we can relate to that in a, in a COVID situation that, um, you know, the the premium of peace and quiet is is substantial. Um, so so that, that's one thing It's like oh, well, if only there were a secluded spot free from distraction. Uh, oh, you know, there is it's just, you know, your home office. Uh, there's a cave right there. And then then you have Gilbert referring or mentioning them going back and forth from a, from a cave. Again, he thinks it's translation, it's not, but he is mentioning the cave about this, this time period. The other thing, and, and I, I just came, came across this uh, recently, if you look up that letter in, in Joe Smith papers, the one that, uh, that Oliver writes to, um, 
to, to Joseph in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, he dates it and he gives the location. And he says Manchester. He says Manchester, uh, New York. And there's a, there's a note on the Joseph Smith papers that says, you know, this was probably written from Hiram's house. So it would actually be Palmyra. So, so if, you, if, you look at, if you look at that, you know, the Joseph Smith paper says, well, actually. And, uh, you know, can we take Oliver at his word? Could that, uh, could that letter have been written in Manchester as he says it was where John Gilbert says that they were operating from a cave? See, so this, I just have to interrupt here for a second. Um, I don't know if you saw my Michael Marquardt interview because... Um, he makes the case that the church was organized in Manchester rather than Fayette, New York. And there, uh, I think he makes a pretty good case. Dan Vogel also kind of agrees with that. Um, and so it does seem like the church is invested in putting it, put, keeping things out of Manchester. So that, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, in any case of, of the, is this Manchester, is this Palmyra, the documentary evidence says, if we take it at face value, it says Manchester. The cave is in Manchester. Um, and, and that was your experience that the cave was in Manchester as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is. And that, that's well established. So, so bottom line, our hypothesis is, and it's not a slam dunk, is that part of the printer's, the printer's edition manuscript may have been copied in the cave. Because uh, Oliver did not give the original copy manuscript that, that you know, fell from the prophet's lips as he copied it. He did not give that to John Gilbert to set the type to print the book for him. He gave a, a copy of that, the printer's manuscript. We believe that that from the original transcript to the printer's manuscript, that transcription process, po the possibility exists that that could have happened in the case. So it's, it's a small contribution and it's not a slam dunk. Maybe it's not a contribution at all, but that's our hypothesis. Wow. What it, what it does do is it, is it kind of increases the value and the relevance of the cave to, to the restoration narrative. If this was a, an important site, uh, you know, that, that, that the Book of Mormon, the pre-publication Book of Mormon was, was processed in this cave, I, I think that that deserves some attention and ought to be acknowledged as, as relevant. Uh, not just, I, I think the, the instinct is to say, oh, you know, well, this was just a treasure dig site. And I think it could have started like that in the 1820s, 18, 18, uh, 1822, 1823. But by the time it's 1829, one, that cave is still there. Gilbert seems to indicate that they're still using it. And what were they doing? Who was doing it? It was Oliver Cowdery and he was, he was translating and he was uh, copying the fringe manuscript. So let me throw this at you because caves are pretty dark, right? And w I mean... Obviously, they didn't have electricity back then. Would it have made sense to have candles in there? Wouldn't wouldn't that have gotten smoky? Or I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the the, the details. They would definitely need some light sources. You know, a either a, a candle or a lamp or or something. Um, I don't know about emissions and you know uh, oxygen levels and and things like that. But you know, they would have been doing that in their homes also. You know, they didn't have electricity in their homes, and and they were doing. I think they they just lived by by candlelight. Yeah. But, but that's a fair, I mean, that's a fair counterpoint, yeah. So the, yeah. the, the other thing about what could have happened in, in the cave is, so printer's manuscript, I think, I think is probably the most compelling hypothesis. Again, not, not a slam dunk. We, we can't establish anything um, uh, with, with, you know, without any question, but I think, I think that's worth, uh, worth considering. So the other stuff that if we just kind of look at the timeline, what was happening in Palmyra, Manchester during this time, uh, you know, Joseph eventually comes back uh, again, 1829, 18, 1830, he comes back from Pennsylvania, and then we have um, we have several sections of the DNC that were received in in Palmyra, and we have the uh, the eight witness experience, um, and none of those really have locations attached to them other than the greater Palmyra Manchester area, and again, you know, if they're in a crowded room or if they don't have a place to board or if they're you know they want to get away from from the crowd, and this cave, this home office, is like why would you not do your work in your home office? Uh, that, again, I think that's something that we can relate to at, at this at this point in history. Um, but uh, I, I think there may be a case to be made that that the the revelatory and you know uh, witness experiences. Um, I think they, if the cave was being used at that time, um, it should at least be considered a candidate for where these things occurred. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Very interesting. And and all the all the references that Casey found are available online on archival.link slash Mormon Cave. Yep. Archival.link slash Mormon Cave. The comprehensive list of, of every reference he was able to find um, referencing the cave. And so we don't know exactly what happened there. That maybe they stored food there. Maybe there were church meetings there. Maybe revelations were received there. We don't know, but it was it was a place. It was a it was a possibility. So we're we're our hypothesis is that it was it was open open to that possibility. To me, the most compelling um, source was uh, David David Whitmer. Yes, uh, I don't know if you want to get into that. Yeah, yeah. So so during this time. You know, after our road trip, we this is kind of the the picture that emerges. This is what may have happened in the cave, and and then that that made us more motivated that we got to find this. We got yeah. to establish that it exists. So, so Casey compiles all these sources and puts them on archival.link slash warm kit, and I go to that myself and I start reading them. And the one that jumped out to me the most that made me want to continue to invest time and pursue this was David Whitmer's testimony, one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon. He did an interview in with the Deseret News. With the Deseret News. And he was asked, uh, where are the gold plates now? The interviewer asked him. Point blank. And he said, uh, what did he say? In a cave. He says, in a cave. And, and then the and interviewer follow, follows up. The Hill Camorra? No. And his response is no, but in a cave not far from the Hill Camorra. Wow. Well, a lot of the sources conflate the two. Oh, you know, there was a cave. It was in Camorra. Oh, there was a cave, you know, whatever. There are very few sources that really make the distinction. There's Kimora, and then there's Miner's Hill, and there's a cave in Miner's Hill. Uh, David, that, that quote from David Whitmer is, is the one. He doesn't mention Miner's Hill, Miner's Hill, but he says, in a cave not far from, from Kimora, like, again, there are no natural caves. If he's talking about a cave, it was dug by human hands, and we have one that was, <laughs> we have a candidate. <laughs> That's awesome. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Casey Kern and Greg Pavone. In our next conversation, we'll talk about what they found when they started digging for the cave. Reality is reality. The cave is real. And, and, and that's, the, that's the bluff. The bottom line up front is, is that the cave is real. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe for just $5 a month at patreon.com slash gospel tangents, and you can hear the entire interview before everybody else. If you'd like to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can either subscribe on YouTube, Patreon, or my website, gospeltangents.com. Just click the yellow subscribe button, and I'll add you to our Gospel Tangents Insiders group so that you can see entire videos. For those interested in a PDF transcript, you can subscribe at either Patreon or on my website. For just $10 a month, I'll send you a PDF as soon as it's complete. If you'd like a copy of the paperback as well as a PDF, just sign up for $20 a month at either Patreon or my website, gospeltangents.com. Of course, you can buy individual transcripts at amazon.com and just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you can see all the things that we have there. Don't forget to support Gospel Tangents with an awesome t-shirt like one of these. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. Get our latest updates at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. Also, you can get our Twitter updates at gospeltangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.